bringing you key insights, tips, and advice from the brightest minds in the Canadian franchising industry. This is the Franchise Canada Chats Podcast. Welcome back to the Franchise Canada Chats podcast. I'm your co-host, Kristen. And I'm Trisha. And last week, we held our annual convention in Niagara Falls, Ontario. It was a great success. Attendees were able to make connections and attend educational sessions. We also announced the award winners of the CFA National Convention. Driver's seat won big. They took home the grand prize in the non-traditional category. Driver's seat is a personal transportation company that provides vehicle and chauffeur services across Canada and the U.S., some of the services that they provide include assisted transportation, airport trippers, designated drivers, and so much more. And in today's podcast, we spoke with co-founder and CEO of Driver's Seat, Brian Baisley. And with him, we discussed why Driver's Seat uses a royalty payment model for their franchisees, how the company sets itself apart with so many other mobile driving apps on the market, their franchisee recruitment process, and a whole lot more. So without further ado, here's Brian Baisley from Driver's Seat. So, can you tell us a little bit about Driver's Seat? Sure. Yeah. Dri- driver's Seat is a, a chauffeur and a shuttle franchise business. So, the two unique services that, that we offer, um, the chauffeur service is having a uh, coachman, which is what we call uh, the drivers that work for the franchisees, coachman drive customers' cars for them. So, they might do that when the uh, customer's impaired or uh, perhaps they want to go to the airport uh, and they come for their own car or if they only like drive on the highway. But it's a, a unique service that allows the franchisee to provide coaching to customers who, who want to be chauffeured. The second uh, service is the Jersey Shuttle Service. And shuttle services um, are uh, how a coachman drive a wrapped uh, mid sized van, so Jersey van, which are, are primarily used for larger contracts, so uh, driving employees uh, to work or working for the Minnesota government or, or other large contracts. But we also do some consumer work in there as well, so uh, could be uh, delivering of people to a wedding or uh, perhaps, uh, um, you know, staying those or uh, taking people to the airport. And when was Driver's Seat created? So we created uh, Driver's Seat in 2012, um, and my brother, Luke, and I um, founded the business. And we came up with the concept, really with the idea of uh, providing options for people who might not uh, be able to drive themselves or using better judgment choose us to drive themselves mm-hmm. and so like, again examples can be someone who's elderly um, and perhaps they can you know tour around town in their own car but they can't go long distances to see family mm-hmm. or somebody who's in a medical condition or somebody who's consumed uh, drugs or alcohol mm-hmm. so we saw a, a really uh, fun and interesting need to provide chauffeurs mm-hmm. uh, in, in mass uh, to to consumers who just had to have their car driven for them um, when we designed the the program, we looked at the opportunity for shuttle um, at the same time, because obviously being in the transportation space, uh, we thought we could kind of tie into that that piece of it. So we launched the chauffeur part in 2012, and then in 2014 we launched the shuttle component. And so it seems like you guys were a little bit ahead of your time, just because now we're seeing um, not similar services, but with Uber. Uh, and Lyft, it's, it's kind of yeah. like people are trying to jump on this bandwagon. Do you feel like you guys are a little bit ahead of your time? Yeah, we we, um, we, we actually had wanted to create, when we started talking in 2011 about creating a business, we wanted to create a business that was um, going to be somewhat disruptive and, and unique before that term was, was overused. Um, and um, it, it, it really is, is interesting how transportation has changed. We're, we're of course, playing a, a large role in that as our franchisees, but the ride share um, onslaught, um, which is which has really helped change people's minds and, and thoughts around how to uh, move around a little bit, um, is now being complemented with you know LRTs and, and new versions of of transportation nodes, and uh, and of course a lot of this is all being enabled through smartphones, which has really changed that dynamic as well. So so yeah, we we were uh, perhaps a little bit ahead of, of that curve, um, but I think the um, the uniqueness of the the business model itself tied to the use of, of the mobile app, um, and then, of course, complemented with the fact that it's a franchise, uh, makes it a really powerful, um, you know, combination. So how did you get this this started? So I know you said you worked with, your, you partnered with your brother, but uh, can you walk us through the process? 
Um, the, the process was, was a little bit different from how you'd imagine starting a business. My brother and I had decided we wanted to work together, and we weren't really um, kind of predetermined, didn't have a predetermined notion as to which industry or which type of business it, it might be. But we really wanted something that we could franchise because I had a, a, a lot of experience in franchising, and I really liked the franchise model. We like we like working with like-minded entrepreneurs, and so neither of us had worked in transportation. But instead of creating a business model, we created a, a governance model around what would make us happy and what do we really want to do for the communities in which we do business in, um, and what type of thing might be fun, enjoyable, different, a little bit disruptive. Um, and uh, was generally, um, you know, very scalable both for the franchisee um, and for the franchisor. And that notion, um, that discussion, then took place over the course of a year as we investigated different business models and different ideas. Um, and then this one surfaced as we saw people struggling to find ways to get their vehicle home from a restaurant after they had wine, or um, somebody who might be aging, for instance, who um, you know, might have to give up their independence because they couldn't drive anymore. And so um, that sparked the idea of transportation, which then sparked the driver's seat. And correct me if I'm wrong, but were you also working in franchising before driver's seat? Yeah, correct. Yeah, I um, I spent a number of years working with uh, with Aiden Fitness. And oh. uh, when I joined Aiden Fitness, they were a Midwestern U.S. Uh, brand uh, only in the U.S. and um, so I started to develop Canada and uh, worked with them um, on, on the franchising side of it. But I also um, opened um, a chain of Aiden Fitness clubs at the same time. So I was a franchisee and I was a franchisor. Mm. So um, I, I've got some experience on both ends of, of that spectrum, which um, you know is proved to be invaluable. And did you end up selling your Anytime Fitness franchises? Um, I did not sell them. I, I, um, I'm not active, so I'm a, a passive investor in them now. Okay. But we have a president. We have a president of that company that now runs that that business. Okay. And so, what kind of challenges did you face early on? Um, I guess starting a business that's you know was kind of new at the time in 2012. Um, what kind of challenges did you face? And I think, you know, when you think about um, the, the concept of developing a franchise model um, and, and growing that piece of it, uh, if you exist in the QSR um, restaurant type of space, it's pretty easy for people to understand and, and envision what that might be like. And, of course, we developed something that just didn't exist before. So the, the part, part of our success but also part of the, the challenge around it was we had to be very – clear and clean with people as to exactly what the business model was mm -hmm. and, and, ha and how they could monetize that as a, as a franchise owner. And so, um, you know, when, when you start talking with franchisees about that side of it, it takes some time to create the, the very succinct pitch that ties to what is a chauffeur service and, and, and how does it differ, for, differ from a, in those days a taxi cab or in today's days a, a, an Uber. Um, and so the better that we got at, at explaining that piece of it, the faster we could engage people with it. Um, and, you know, it, it's so interesting because it's such, there, there's such a, a, a significant amount of potential for a franchisee in our, in our system. Um, the ones that truly get into it and, and, and engage with us and, and really start to uncover all of the different opportunities, um, really get excited by it. But it, it's really about getting that message out to people in fairly short order because, of course, life's busy and people get busy and, not everyone wants to um, read a whole lot of, uh, of material and, and you know, they're inundated with information through web and social media. So we have to cut through that in, in very short order. Mm. All right. Do you find that pe uh, prospective franchisees are more respect receptive to the concept today compared to seven years ago? Yeah, they, they are. Um, many, I, I think that, you know, what, what we experience, of course, um, and, and other, I'm sure other franchisors experience the same, but Many of our, our franchisees were customers or were, were coachmen for, for us and uh, then became a franchisee. So it becomes it just becomes a simpler process today. Um, in the early days, not only were we a, a brand new uh, franchise or, but no one had ever really heard of a driving service like this before. And so, um, you know, we could easily get bypassed um, in, in someone's franchise search. And those that signed on early, uh, got really excited because they, they 
got helped shape the, the company and, and of course they, they benefited from it greatly um, as they grew their business year after year. Um, and, and those that, that didn't either now can't get that same you know community that might, community might be bought up already um, or they moved on to something else. So, so in today's world it's a little bit easier but we still have a lot of education to, to do with people uh, and uh, media communication is, is moving faster, not slower than it used to. So, uh, explaining our concept, explaining what we do in very, you know, fairly short order on, a, on an Instagram screen or on a brief YouTube video uh, becomes that much more important. And what are you looking for in your franchisees? You know, our, our, our franchisees um, it, ultimately they, they truly have to uh, love working with people. Uh, this really is a business development type of role. Uh, they're not, they don't need to be really tied to, to the operations. A whole lot of software manages most of that. So they really have to love business development and, and, and talking with people. Um, and so we'll often talk with them about the, the three core components and roles of the franchise owner. One being building a strong employment brand, so engaging with lots of prospective franchisees. The second be marketing their, their business, uh, which is, is very critical. Um, and some of that involves going up and talking with people uh, at chamber events, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Right? And the third piece is, is engaging with customers. And so all three of those are, are really connected to how effective a communicator they are. And so we, we look for someone that, that truly understands those three components. Um, and then from a personality perspective, I would say they need to be somewhere between a, a, an omnivert and an extrovert. Um, okay. in personality style, mm. they, you know, they, they've got to be able to be out there, um, talk to people, engage with people, um, and, you know, not be withdrawn from, from those sorts of conversations. Um, mm. I think an introvert, um, you know, there's lots of great businesses for someone like that. I, I just don't think a business development role in owning a driver's and franchise might be the right one. And are your franchisees uh, more on the younger side, or do you find that you have all types of generations uh, coming to yeah, your business? You know, it, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Our, uh, we have a requirement um, that, that, our, that our drivers, the coachmen, are 25 and up. Um, and that's because of, of the way uh, insurance works. And so, you know, <laughs> our youngest franchisee is 24. Wow. <laughs> so, so, so he, he's, he's definitely the youngest of, of anybody in, in his entire group. Um, but our oldest franchisee is, is 78. Wow. And so, yeah, it, it's really a terrific range in, in, in there. And I think it's because the you, know, you don't really have to have transportation experience. You don't have to have a significant amount of business experience because I think we're, we're good at teaching that side of it. Mm-hmm. Um, you just have to be somebody that's really passionate about growing your business, communicating with, with people, building a strong employment brand. Um, and, of course, as a result, it comes in, in kind of all different ways and sizes. Mm-hmm. And so what kind of support do you offer your, your franchisees? You have such a range, 25 to, to 78, you said? That's a... We start with a very extensive um, onboarding uh, program, so new franchisee training and onboarding program. Um, that starts with three weeks of um, training that they start doing in their home, from their home office. Mm-hmm. So we send them electronic files and they start to prepare for new franchisee training through electronic means. Um, and then on the fourth week, they come in for one week of in-classroom training with us. Um, and um, Luke, who's, who's my, my brother and my partner, Luke and I personally do about 90% of that training. So it's it's uh, we're, we're very committed to that side of it. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it's a workshop-based training. We, we pre-set up all of their marketing tools, social media, etc. And we pre-set up all of their electronic storage means and the software and all of these things. And we literally spend a week with them teach them exactly what they need to do day in day out, but it's all done through through workshops, so it's a, a very kind of interactive um, and active uh, week. During that same week, they have 10 hours of homework, which is electronically tracked mm-hmm. um, through Travis University. Following the franchise training, they have about five weeks of, of post work to do back at their own office, mm-hmm. um, and then they're able to watch. Okay, So that's the, that's the initial kickoff, which of course is, is extensive and, and really, really powerful. Uh, then we do uh, live coaching. So live coaching, uh, we have access to all of their information, um, you know, that, you know, whether it's marketing, social media, sales, customer accounts, um, even driving habits of the, of the coachman. And so live coaching happens when uh, either we see something where we think it's an opportunity for them to, to have a better business or where they see something that might be a gap in their own business model. 
and um, they have direct access into a support team um, through a communication app um, here at the office, and they simply just message, and, and, and whoever the first one to pick up that message will contact them and help them with that. And in addition to that, we do um, regular webinars on, on updates and, and um, retraining. We do we have Jarvis University, which is an electronic e-learning module, mm -hmm. um, and annually we do a, a four-day um, conference, which is very content intensive, very content rich. I would not say mandatory conference for all franchise owners, uh, but all of their um, uh, yeah, anybody from their team is, is welcome to come to that. And so often they'll bring um, you know supervisors who might supervise some of the drivers, um, or uh, a spouse who might work part time in the business with them or a general manager or a marketing manager that might have work for them. So they'll often bring a, a fair, fair size crew to that. Yeah, I, had, I was interviewing one of your franchisees, Spencer, and he was telling me about your conference, and he said it was amazing. He's like, if you go to those yeah. conferences, it's like... <laughs> game-changing. Yeah, game-changing. Like, he was, like, really selling it, and I was like, wow, maybe I should. <laughs> <laughs> I was like... So it's just yeah. going to become the next <laughs> franchisee. It's, 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 it's very interesting because, yeah, so, so we... Uh, we do have mandatory play in our, in our business, and, and we make sure that we're, we're having fun and not taking ourselves too mm -hmm. seriously. Of course, the, the job of getting parent drivers off the road is serious, so um, we, we try and balance that piece of it. Uh, but the conference, we, we put a lot of effort into it, but it, it's a very well-designed piece that um, you know cr creates a, a collaborative uh, you know environment for the franchisees, mm -hmm. and uh, they do leave motivated. They, they do leave passionate about it. They do leave with, with lots of good laughs. And um, I, I encourage you to check out our our, <laughs> our YouTube page yeah. uh, next week because we'll be releasing two new videos uh, to the franchisees, and, and they're a little bit off the wall. So yeah, just watching those. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, you mentioned that one of one of the reasons I guess you started was to show for people um, who may be under the influence. Um, I'm just wondering, have you guys ever partnered with Mad? Or any organization that maybe tries to prevent drinking and driving? Mm -hmm. Yeah, at the, at the local levels, the driver seat uh, franchisees work with lots of uh, lots of uh, organizations, and, and Matt can, can definitely be one of them. Um, we, we've talked with with Matt. It's uh, it, it can be um, it can be very costly to to be a national sponsor with them. Mm -hmm. um, so we've chosen just you know they're a great organization. We've chosen not to spend the money on, on that side of it. Uh, but we do support them in all that they do, and there's a number of, uh, and, and there's a there's an Ontario branch of, of a it's a students can start driving. Um, there's a number of you know other provincial branches that are out there. So there's a lot of support and a lot of collaboration that goes along, um, you know, with, with the type of work we do, and that actually includes the police departments as well. So we're we're quite well connected uh, for our franchisees with their local police department um, and supporting the message of not drinking and driving. And of course, being out there to provide service if a police officer were to uh, want someone not to be driving if they consume some alcohol, um, driver seats just a, you know, a, a quick tap away for, for that officer to get uh, a team of drivers down there to get that car home. Mm -hmm. uh, so, is the, is the drunk driving piece like? Uh, so, I know. So, what I'm basically trying to get to is that there's some provinces that have higher drunk driving rates than others. Like, I know Saskatchewan, I think has like the highest yes. in Canada, I believe. Yes. So do it, you, it does, yeah. it does, okay, yeah. So do you focus your efforts, like would you pass up one franchisee for another, I guess? I don't know how the process works exactly, for like to focus on one area. Like do you have more franchisees in like Saskatchewan mm -hmm. versus yeah. other places? Yeah, great, yeah, great, great question. We, um, we're really more focused on the, on, on the people side of, of it, so it's really about the right printer. Pardon me, the right franchisee um, who can grow their community versus you know a, a market that might be slightly larger in one area versus another based on on, on the one stat. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so our our goal is always to develop, lead, and help grow the business for great franchisees. And, and um, it's really, it's really interesting because in some markets they do a significant amount of airport chauffeur. And so airport chauffeur, they're a coachman driving a customer's car for them to the airport, draws them at the terminal door and then puts the car back in the driveway. Mm -hmm. And it's such a great way to get to the airport or be picked up from the airport. So in, in communities that are within kind of a couple hours of drive of, of one of the major airports, they do a significant amount of, of airport chauffeur work. 
mm-hmm. in some of the communities, um, that's just you know, not as big a, a, a part of the, the, the business or, or the market. In other um, parts, there's perhaps a, a, an aging population, so they do more in this assisted transport, helping the elderly in, in the vulnerable sector. Um, and so there's, there's really lots of different areas to tap into. Um, it, it, you know, the, one of the best kept secrets of the driver's seat brand is everyone looks at it as an impaired driving business, but it's actually the smallest, it, it, it's, a, it's a very small percentage of our overall revenue um, count because there's lots of customers doing it, but, but it's a transactional piece that the app handles for, for the franchisee, where they, they really are doing significant business uh, with um, retirement homes and with employers and, and doing more of a BD type contract. And can you um, just maybe list the type of services, the chauffeuring services that you do provide? I'm sorry, I missed that. the type of service the chauffeurs do which? This, can you, sorry, can you list the chauffeuring services that you do provide? So, um, the, so basically the clients that you're serving? Yeah, so, so um, you can categorize them under, under four categories. So the designated driving, uh, which is an, uh, an on-call, so it's, it's used through the mobile app, very similar to a Lyft or, or an Uber type of feel to that, um, except for when the uh, coachman shows up, there's two of them, one to drive your car and one to drive the, the, the follow car or the chase car. Um, so definitely drive is one, one part of it. Um, vehicle chauffeur is, is the second one, and vehicle chauffeur is tied to any time you need to move a vehicle where the customer's not in that vehicle. Mm-hmm. And so we do a lot of work for auto body shops. We do a lot of work for um, uh, you know garages, picking up cars for customers, getting them dropped off, uh, putting snow tires on, on cars. Um, but then we do some, some really fun, unique things like um, driving a car to Florida from Toronto. Cool. Um, like <laughs> down there and, How long does yeah, that take? <laughs> so not, not a bad way to get paid. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, then, uh, and then one of the more unique ones, one of the franchisees um, had a coachman just recently drive a woman and her birds to Newfoundland. Wow. <laughs> really? And, and so she wanted someone she could trust. She read a lot about the Jersey brand. Um, she cares for her birds immensely. <laughs> and wants to travel out there with them. So um, she rented a van, and uh, they loaded up all these bird cages, and then every evening, the coachman, she, she got two hotels, one for her, one for the coachman, and every evening they would go and have dinner together, and the coachman would help her load all the birds into the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Right. That's amazing. So, 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 so we really do get to do some, some extraordinary, um, unique services from that mm-hmm. point. The, the third service um, is a chauffeur uh, service, a chauffeur for hire. And this is really an hourly chauffeur for your vehicle. And so business people will use it so they can work during the day while they're traveling. Um, people who've got um, anxiety challenges but need to travel on a, on a highway or something that might use it to get to work. Um, and then certainly the, we do things like uh, uh, bringing kids to private schools in mom or dad's car. Um, so at any time there's a chauffeur service hire that, that we, we call it that, and that's just an hourly type of uh, package. And then the final one is, is um, airport chauffeur, um, which is it's got its own category just because it's such a large part of what we do. Um, and essentially, at, at any point in time, there, there could be just many, many uh, deputy drivers or, or airport chauffeur drivers out driving people to uh, Pearson or Billy Bishop or you know one, one of the airports out west um, in the cover of the customer's own car. And you guys are based in Kitchener, Ontario. Is that right? Do you have franchises across the country, or are you mostly in Ontario? Uh, we're in four provinces now, and in another uh, eight or ten weeks, we'll, we'll open up two more provinces. Great. So, not, not quite across Canada, but we're getting there. Awesome. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, just going back to your franchisees a bit, uh, I know you have a different royalty system set up for your franchisees. Can you tell us a little bit yeah. about that? Yeah, we... Um, <laughs> Well, of course, almost every franchise system operates off of a, a percentage royalty. Um, we've chose to go a different route. We, we operate off a flat fee royalty. And so, um, as an example, the current flat fee is $419 per month. Um, and it's, a, it's just a flat rate. And um, we designed it that way um, for, for a number of reasons. The primary one was you know, we really love building strong relationships with our, our franchisees. And they're a natural friction point can exist in franchising, um, and it is natural because it's tied to money, but it, it always exists around a percentage royalty. So inevitably, you'll end up with some franchisees who might not want to pay a percentage royalty on something, so they might try and hide a sale. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, the franchisor 
need to fund their business through through collecting royalties, so then they have to audit to find the money. And so there's a lot of energy spent, um, and, and it's not positive energy either, but there's a lot of energy spent in, in franchise systems just keeping those numbers true and, 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 and up to up to date. And of course, then the franchisor is making decisions based on that data, um, mm-hmm. that sales data. And so we, we decided to go with a flat rate system, um, and it's unique, um, of course, in that the franchisee gets to you know tremendously benefit from, from growing their sales, and they don't have to give up a, a percentage of it at all. But really what it does um, is it, two things. One is, again, we don't have to spend time auditing or um, spend time on, on negative energy. But the second piece is, when we are working with a franchisee to help land a larger contract or a larger sale, um, you know, we will coach them through that. We talked a little bit earlier about our, our training and coaching model. We will coach them through that and really work with them to, to help them provide the best quote and the best analytics possible for, for the customer. And when we're doing that and we're, we're you know, really pushing the franchisee to make sure that this is the best of the best they possibly deliver, there's never really a preconceived notion on their part that we're doing that for self-serving purposes. Mm. They, they, they know that we're doing this because we have their, their best interest at heart. And so it really does change that dynamic between the franchisor and the franchisee. And from our perspective, um, franchisees making a lot of money is a really good thing because they do two things. They open up additional territories um, and or they will talk to prospective franchisees, talk about what a great business it is and, and talk about their, their revenue and get people excited by it. So, you know, we, we really, um, we love to see them succeed in that side of it and we're happy to give up the, that percentage of, of the of the loyalty um, just by sticking the flat rate. Um, and it really allows us to be super efficient in what we do because um, at the end of the day, we just focus on project development growth and top line growth for the franchisees. And, you know, you mentioned that you really, you obviously want to see that your franchisees succeed, but I think with any business, there there are some challenges. Um, with this with this business in particular, what are some of the challenges that your franchi- franchisees might face? You know, it, it's, it's, every business does have their, their challenges. It's, it's so interesting that our challenges are so small in comparison. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the business model just, just really does accommodate that. Um, so when I think about most franchise systems and um, the franchise you have to deal with the logistics of what, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's food or, or something else they're dealing with and all that, that ties to it, they do end up spending a, a significant amount of their time on logistical or operation, um, you know, side, side of it. So of course they, they might not develop to become strong leaders or, uh, you know, market their, their brand in their, in their area better than they could have yesterday. And again, we just, we, so we just don't have those challenges and we, and we don't have um, the capital challenges because they can start out um, with one vehicle which they use for marketing purposes. They can go in into shuttle, but then they can just uh, add additional vehicles, uh, vans, and for shuttle as they grow. So, so again, this does come with those same cash challenges. Mm-hmm. The, the most unique thing that a home-based franchise, which is what we are, a home-based franchise uh, faces, is the fact there's no real estate. And so that comes with the advantage of no capital, but the, the challenge with that is you really have to be actively marketing your brand each and every day. Mm-hmm. And the minute that you take your, your, your proverbial foot off the gas pedal, um, you know, your, your, your business will slow down. And so you know, we knew that going into it. We we're very aware of it. We're, we focus a lot on the marketing side of it, but the, the franchisee who, who comes into driver's seat they don't have to know everything there is to know about marketing because we absolutely teach them that, mm-hmm. but they have to be passionate every single day about marketing their business because if they don't, it, it'll be, become pretty apparent that the, the city forgets about them. Mm. What, what, do you, what do you find that franchisees typically underestimate when they start out in this business? Uh, I, I think ours is probably not all that dissimilar from, from any franchise system that has, that has employees, but you really have to be a great leader, uh, and, we, and we focus on that side of it. Um, at the end of the day, we, we are nothing without our corporate office team, and, and we're certainly nothing without our franchisees. And so, um, leading them every day, and getting up, and being passionate about them every day is, is what I do. And they have to really do the same thing. You have to, to be a strong leader and demonstrate strong leadership skills. Mm-hmm. And I think, by and large, in, in franchising, um, there might be a little bit of a misconception with a franchisee that says, well, I'm going to get a recipe and, and every day I'll, you know, kind of have this recipe of things that I need mm-hmm. to do. And if I do that, I'm successful. Well, 
that can work at times, right? But the ones that are really successful is because they very well demonstrate great leadership and, and get their team engaged to to be extraordinary. That being said, what would uh, what would your advice be for prospective and current driver seat franchisees? Yeah, I, I would say um, be very, very passionate um, in all that you do. Um, th- this is not really about working hard. This is about um, being passionate about every customer that you come in contact with, being passionate about your coachman and about your brand. And if you if you can demonstrate pure passion for the customer, passion for getting them home safely, passion for your coachman, passion for ensuring your coachman are making great money. Um, the rest will come very, very easy. Um, so, you know, we, we would always say that if somebody lacks passion um, or lacks the desire to, to create a very strong business within their family, then we wouldn't be the place for them. Uh, there, there might be another franchise for them. But for someone that comes in with, with real passion and real desire to create a, a, an incredible you know, work home life for themselves. Um, this this is a, a great brand for that. So, so I, I would say that you know a little bit of um, self evaluation is, is probably necessary, and um, you know understanding why that plays such an important role in business and in particular in the driver's seat business. And so, what's next for you and your business? Well, we we've had a really really interesting past uh, thirteen months. We. Um, we spent the better part of 2018 focusing on top line growth for, for all of our franchisees and our corporate site um, in order to push the limits. And we broke a number of uh, very significant records that we had internally. And so, with that foundation laid um, and, and with all of the strength behind us on that side of it, uh, 2019 is really all about franchise development um, and growth. So, our technology platforms are st- extremely strong, our revenue lines are extremely strong. So everything that we're doing now is, is to open up additional markets. Uh, this includes um, the U.S., where, where we're really close to landing our first three uh, franchise locations. Mm-hmm. So we have uh, we've issued the FTD, uh, we're registered in the in the U.S., and um, and we're actively talking to a number of a number of uh, uh, interested parties. So so we're, we're anxious to get the U.S. open. Uh, we are also talking to uh, prospective master franchise boards in uh, Australia and New Zealand. Um, and so, so our, our goal is to continue to develop Canada and to develop our existing franchisees, but now to give them the, the competitive edge by having us open in, in multiple countries, mm-hmm. uh, which will of course you know provide you know lots of support both online and in just in, in brand awareness overall. So, so we've got some some big uh, some big plans ahead. We will more than double in size uh, this year, and. Um, uh, we think next year we, we have the potential to, to at least uh, double again, if not just a little bit more than that. Sorry, do you have master franchisors in as well, right? Currently, you have your you know no, no? okay. Yeah. So this is new. No, we, we, yeah, so, so we, in, in, we we made the conscious decision in Canada and the U.S. to um, go with the franchise direct route uh, in in both both these markets because we can manage the sales process and technology and vehicle and all that type of thing. Um, quite easily from, from, from our main office here. Um, in all of the other countries, we will, we will partner up with somebody to do a master franchise or system. Got it. And, and the revenue numbers. Awesome. 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 And are you ready to play some franchise fun? <laughs> so, this is where we'll, we'll throw sentence starters at you, um, your way, and if you could just fill in the blanks, um, and that's that'll be franchise fun. <laughs> Awesome. All right. The most interesting thing I've done recently is? The uh, most interesting thing I've done recently is I went hiking in Iceland. Cool. Oh, that's really cool. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I've got a personal passion for, for travel, so, uh, so that, was, that was a particularly fun one. Wow. Where's the best place you've ever been? Best place I've ever been, besides the driver's seat office, <laughs> I would say, <laughs> I, uh, I would say uh, Alaska. Cool. Um, I, yeah, I, it's really odd because I've traveled in 54 countries, mm. and I, I love the experience of travel, uh, but Alaska is quite magical, and I, I love uh, mountain climbing, and so my wife and I uh, climbed the mountain uh, in Alaska, and, um, and then hiked on glaciers for, for a couple of weeks. Wow. Very cool. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 
I think that was like the best That's response the best we've answer. got so far. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and its best form work is? Uh, its best work, uh, form work is not work. Um, work should never be started or stopped. Work should be never be considered work. It should be, be considered part of life. And, um, you know, we, we should always have balance in what we do. And some of that includes sleep and some of that includes um, a healthy lifestyle, staying active and keeping your body in good shape. And that's, that's, that's very critical, both for the body and mind. Um, some of it includes pure entertainment. Um, it definitely includes a lot of time with family. Um, and it includes, you know, what, what some people view as, as work. But, uh, you know, I, I think like a lot of entrepreneurs, our, our work days just blend. There's no such thing as a start or stop time. And uh, I can't tell you how many hours I work in a week because every single day is just an experience. And, and we experience time with people in the corporate office and with our franchisees. And I experience time with my wife and with my children. Um, and, and it's all just experiences. So, um, yeah, work, work is just not work. A good franchisee. A good franchisee loves themselves, they love their family, they love their customers, um, and they love the challenge of building business. A good franchisor? A good franchisor truly partners with the franchisee and is absolutely obsessed with the top-line revenue growth for that franchise unit. The most important thing in life is? Family. If I could meet anyone, it could be fictional, it could be dead alive. If I could meet anyone, well, this is a good one. Um, I, I would probably say Lee Iacocca. Oh, cool. Um, cool. I think, I think um, before there was a lot written on business leadership and you know, before there was a better understanding of, of how strong leadership could, could really um, you know, play a role in the development of the company. The I Coca did some pretty amazing things. Um, so, um, yeah, I think uh, I think that he was a man ahead of his time, and he's probably been he's been highly rated, but he's all, I also think he's underrated. <laughs> Canadian franchising is. A Canadian franchising is. Yes. Canadian franchising. Oh, Canadian franchising. Oh, sorry. Oh. Canadian franchising is is brilliant. Uh, the it is the single best way to engage in, in business and business growth. Um, and, and as I mentioned when we, we first started talking, we actually decided to develop a franchise before we even knew what business or industry this was. So uh, I, I can't say enough about the franchise, the the, the, the franchise model, um, and, and franchising just as a as an industry or a standalone industry. It's, it's really 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 outstanding. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brian. That was uh, great. And thank you for taking the time to, to talk to Kristen my, and I. <laughs> my, my pleasure. wonderful. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to the Franchise Canada Chats podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. For more, head to FranchiseCanada.online.